Hi, everybody. Welcome to Craft. I am here with the awesome Wiley and Mallory Brady Cash is my guest this week. Thank you all for coming. Uh, for those of you who have not joined a craft event before, we usually host this lovely gathering of writers at the wonderful Little Jumbo in downtown Asheville. Uh, Wiley and Mallory have both had the privilege of going to Little Jumbo and seeing what a delightful spot it is. Uh, and also one of the features of craft is that we pair a cocktail with each individual writer, um, or in this case, writer photographer team, inspired by either the people themselves or something they have worked on recently. Uh, that is still being done, thank goodness, by Shaw Gray, co-owner of Little Jumbo. He looks at all the books that I'm doing while craft is online. He comes up with a recipe. I will share that special recipe inspired by uh, Wiley and Mallory about halfway through the session. So before we get started um, in this space, such as it is, I'll give you a little tour. So as you can see on uh, your right, my left, uh, you have the chat bar. So feel free to say hi to folks. Um, sometimes things will come up in conversation and uh, Mr. Joe is lurking in the background. He will attempt to feed <laughs> feed links uh, for folks so that they can keep up with some of the things that come up during conversation. Um, also down at the bottom of your screen, you will see a little button that says order signed books uh, by Wiley, Mallory, and Denise. How can they do that, you might wonder? Well, the awesome Malaprops bookstore here in here where I am in Asheville, North Carolina, which uh, is our, our beloved associated bookstore with this event. Although we support all indies, um, Malaprops uh, has a special page up for every craft event. You can click on that link and you'll be taken to a page that has uh, books by all of us. If you order one, you simply tell Malaprops, uh, we would like a signed copy and any of us will get a signed book plate over to Malaprops and they'll ship it out to you with an autographed book plate. How cool is that? So thank you, Malaprops, as always. Uh, of course, if you would like to order from your uh, own indie bookstore or a bookstore of your choice, please feel free to do that. Um, also, let's see, ah, ask a question. So it, you, you don't have to put questions in the chat. I mean, it's, an, it's not a no-no if you do, but there's a lovely ask a question button down there and you can click on that. You can enter your question there, kind of keeps them all corralled in one place. Uh, or you can simply vote up a question that somebody else has asked that you want to hear answered. And that's about it. We're going to save some time at the end to get to those questions. And before that, we're just going to see where the uh, conversation takes us. And after all of this is done, this is being recorded right now. I will send out a recap uh, that will have uh, links that came up during the conversation. And you can watch this anytime here on Crowdcast, and you can also watch it over on YouTube. And that's that. Hello, guys. How are you? Hello. Where, 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 are you, where, are you, where are you talking to me from? This is our dining room. Uh, we moved into a tiny house last October. So this is we're talking to you from basically the house. This is it. This is our and dining room slash library. In Wilmington, yes? Yes, in Wilmington, yes. Uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. And, and when Mallory says tiny house, it may give the impression that we're like actually hipsters living in like some cool, funky, tiny house that we can- Like a yurt, build. like you have your own yurt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but we don't. We live in like a, a brick and mortar tiny house, which is somehow a much worse decision than living on a house on a flatbed trailer that you can pull around the United States. It's cute, it's cute. <laughs> it's cute in a way that like little bugs are cute before you like step on them to get them. <laughs> um, that's cute and interesting. We've been our lives and, and, our, and our belongings and our privacy. It's been it's been interesting. There you go. I love it. And you know, oh, I see you taking a sip. So normally we would be able oh. to drink your specialty cocktail together, but instead we can just drink like this. But cheers to you guys and thank you yeah, all for awesome. coming. Yay, yay. Um, so how has it been? I mean, as a husband and wife, writer and photographer, you 
I'm assuming I'm trying not to, you know, cause I know you guys, so I'm trying not to, you know, fill in what I, what I gleaned from our, our past together. You guys didn't set out to be a writer photographer team. No, no, definitely not. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> Uh, you know, definitely not. Yeah, I, I saw in the comments, it says lots of reverb in the audio. I'm not sure if that's us or you they're talking about, but if we need to move it closer or get ahead. Yeah, Karen, Karen Hall Swartzel, who's, who's got more of the reverb? Is it me or um, Wiley and Mallory? Can you tell or is it sort of all over the place? You sound great to us, so it might yeah, be Yeah, it might be us. Yeah, you but... sound great to me too. Um, okay, let's just keep going. Let's just keep going. All right, let's keep going. Yeah, so, you know, I... It wasn't a photographer uh, when we met, and I only became a professional photographer a few years ago when I actually started, you know, trying to make a living out of it. And so we just uh, kind of didn't get to spend much time together because we had two kids and we were busy and we just thought, well, why don't we try to find jobs that we can do together? So we kind of started like two years ago, I guess, with, that, with Step Into the Circle, the, the, the book, uh, Modern Appalachia book, and then we just have found so many, uh, so many projects we've been able to work together on. Great. Yeah. And it's, so in a sense, sort of, I like when necessity takes you in a new creative direction, actually, maybe yeah. one that wasn't totally expected, but Mallory, um, you didn't expect to sort of be a professional photographer either. No, definitely not. I, I went to law school and was practicing in West Virginia uh, for a couple of years. And then we moved to North Carolina and I took the bar, uh, and practiced for a year. And then we had our first daughter who was six and I took a year off, uh, and got, and then we had another daughter. So that year has turned into six. And so it just kind of naturally went from there. I've always, I've always taken pictures. I've always loved uh, to do that. And, um, but I never considered it as a viable career option until a few years ago. What? Yeah, it was interesting. What what happened was we were doing a lot of traveling um, with friends or for, for just whatever. And Mallory got a nice camera and was taking these great photos. And I'm kind of looking at the photos. And then we have our first baby and she's taking pictures of our daughter. And I'm kind of looking at those pictures. And, and it was just something that it was obvious that she enjoyed. And it was something that she was obviously really good at and that satisfied her. And then just one thing kind of led to another and it was just kind of like, do I, do I dare try to step out and do this for a living and, and make a, make a go with this. And, and it just kind of worked out, you know, at least it has so far so for far. both of us. Yeah. yeah That's kind of the, the leap you have to take as a creative individual anyway, though, to a certain extent. Right. I mean, there's not much of a, whether you're a writer or you're a photographer, there's not much of a net and, I feel from my experience, and I think from yours as well, and other people I've talked to, it's not as though some, you know, one day you wake up and you say, oh, today's the day from, it's going to work now. I should do it now. It's going to work now. So you you sort of have to keep, um, it's almost as though you have like life and the creative life you want. And if you keep at it, one sort of starts to take up more room happily mm -hmm. in, in your own life and um, talking to people who are trying to do that in their own lives. Uh, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you tell folks? Cause I know, I know you guys get asked, you know, how do you, you know, how do you decide whether or not, because I, 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 I don't know if you guys get this, but you know, I get a lot of people who are like, how do you know it's going to work or how do you make sure, make sure, you know, how can you be sure before you blank? And the thing is like, well, you can't, I, yeah, I don't think you can be, you know, after my, after we sold my first book, we were living in West Virginia, uh, in Morgantown. She was practicing law. I had a tenure track job, uh, at a little liberal arts college in, in West Virginia. And my, my contract was such that I had finished a book, sold it, had another, another book to write under my contract. And we were talking about time, you know, how much, how much time can I spend writing a book if I'm teaching effectively nine classes a year at this college and doing all this advising. And she said, you know, your, your, your dream has always been to write books. It's never been to teach a four, four load at a small private liberal arts college. So why don't you do that? And luckily we had her, you know, career as a, as a cushion at that moment. But then when, 
our first daughter was born and she took and time off from the law, we really didn't have a cushion. Yeah. And it really became sink or swim uh, yeah. with, with, with writing books. And then luckily, you know, UNCA came along, but also at that time, she took a step of a leap of faith, if you will, into photography. And, and even now people say, you know, what does it feel like to have a career in writing? Or what does it feel like to be a professional photographer? And it feels tenuous and scary and uncertain and alternately hopeful and alternately foolish. You know, you think every, I mean, I'm sure you, you're, you, and, you and Joe are the same, Denise, but every project that I begin, I think this is the one. <laughs> this is the one where I can finally stop worrying, you know? And That's I think if so you didn't- you stop worrying that's i need to spend more time with you it's like yeah. I, i'm constantly like the saber tooth tiger is behind me like that's yeah. why i've never gotten rid of that kind of primal that primal no matter how well things go it it's it's just there's another there's another shoe somewhere and it's about to drop and it's a very big shoe and it will probably land on my head and concuss me <laughs> so it, that's that's kind of where but I, but I do know what you mean. And there is this idea of every new project has this in incredible potential. Um, but what I would say, um, and coming out of this as someone who, you know, Joe is also, a, I'm in a, you know, we're both writers. Um, you guys are a writer and photographer and we've collaborated and some, and then we do a lot, you know, things separately. Um, sharing work, between each other is happens obviously um how how willing have you been um to share your work with others because uh, like some people are big into uh you know writing groups or creative groups where they share their work and get feedback and you know i personally have not i that's never sort of been a thing for me um how do you guys do a lot of that? I have certain people I share stuff with, but not sort of larger groups until I'm really, really ready. And um, I, I think it's sort of, for me, I don't know, for me, it speaks to sort of a, a level of, of trust and comfort. Um, but you guys coming at it from different artistic disciplines, I don't know if that has impacted your willingness or not to share your work with people, you know, you're not married to. Yeah. Early on, early on in the process, like during the process, I feel like it for you. You used to be more willing to do that. It seems I might be wrong, but it seems like the last two years or so, it's been more of he. You didn't even want to talk about what the next book was about, like even the, what the basic plot or any where it takes place. You were just like not going to talk about it yet. But before, I feel like you were you would share things a little more. Yeah. Um, but maybe, I don't know. I don't share any, any of my stuff with anyone except for him. Well, even, I mean, even like when she comes home from doing a project, she sometimes will share out of the camera stuff with me. Sometimes you he's, did with, he's uh, lurk. he likes to lurk. I do lurk. I'm uploading my, <laughs> when she's uploading the, the, the stuff from the yeah. card or like gets the film. Yeah, stands and I'm back, like, Can you wait? I will look over her shoulder and she's like, stop. They're not, I'm not ready. I haven't even seen them on the screen yet. And, yeah. Um, and so, and I'm not really, you know, I think with my first book, I, I wrote it in such delicious, luxurious privacy. Mm -hmm. And it was so new and novel and sweet that I would like write a page and call her and read it to her. This is, we didn't, weren't, really, weren't really emailing a lot back then. So I read to her a lot. We weren't even living in the same town. Yeah, I read to her a lot. Still reads out loud a lot. Um, but, but I think the, the longer I go on, the, my, the privacy of the work feels um, I feel like I have less privacy with the work to discuss it, to not be asked about it, which is fantastic that people want to know. Sure. But at the same time, I feel like sometimes when you talk too much about your work, it has a tendency to feel done when it's not. Sure. And so you can talk about something as if it's a completed idea. And then you have this, this kind of crushing realization that it's not even close to being complete. Right. And you shouldn't, you should have spent that time at the desk. And so even now with her, I'm less likely to show her piecemeal stuff. Uh, yeah. With my last book, I said, I'm only going to show, I'm going to show you much less than I ever have before. 
So I was showing her like chunks of chapters, um, which was which still was, kind of overwhelming. But it was good way. because before, like he said, I would read and read and read and, you know, obviously drafts change dramatically. And so we would get to the point where we have the paper in front of us, the last line at it, and we're catching stuff. And I can't remember if which draft, what was in and continuity issues. And I'm like, it, I just was like, I don't, I just don't want to see it until it's a good draft because otherwise the context of it, you know, comes into play. Like I know what he wanted to do. And so maybe I'll read into that. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be able to come at it fresh. And I think we, I was also busy and in a bad mood. I had two very young kids. So I was just like, I don't come at me with that right now, but <laughs> it ended up working out better. I think the um, other kid, the, the unfinished manuscript is the other kid. Right, yeah. Right. Always. Yeah, yeah. And last battle, my, my novel, The Last Ballad, was such a dumpster fire until right at the end, it wasn't. But even like in the waning days of writing it and putting the, the book together, there were times when she was just like, I don't know if this is going to work. I don't I don't know if this if this is a book, really. And that was terrifying. Yeah. Um, and suddenly it just was. But I had inundated her with so many parts of it. Because it's, it's, a, it's a piecemeal book. It's all these different parts. Um, and that kind of wore her down a little bit. Isn't it good, though, to... I think this kind of relates to something that I think um, writers and coll artistic collaborators come up against. It's so important to have uh, trusted critics, trusted mm -hmm. readers, trusted viewers, just trusted artistic critics who have really have your best, they want you to be the best that you can be. It's not, they're not like blowing smoke and telling you how awesome you are, how great something is when it's not. It's more, you know, they're coming from a place of, you know what, I know you can, I know you can do better. I know this can be better. This isn't quite working. You wouldn't want this out. You can't see it right now, but you wouldn't want this out in the world in this shape. So I'm going to tell you what I like about it, but I'm also going to tell you that this is not working for me and I, I want it to work for me. Here's why I want it to work for me. And I think it's really because criticism is so difficult to take, no matter what kind of artistic discipline you're in. It's so important to understand, um, to consider the source and to know that that person really just wants your wants you to do wants you to put your best work out into the world. And that's something I, I try to get across to people when they because um, I, I have I, I, I've talked to, to writers. Um, who have said, you know, I, I, I keep, you know, reading this thing, I'm in this group and I keep, and everybody keeps telling me this and telling me that. And at a certain point, I mean, there can just be way too much information coming in. And if you ask someone you don't really know in that setting, what they think of something, they're going to tell you, right? Mm -hmm. And if they don't, they're going to come up with something. Um, so, I mean, Wiley, you, you teach, you know, you teach, you still teach, you still teach creative writing. What do you tell, and you're in a setting where students are actually uh, criticizing each other's work. I mean, what do you tell them about how how to do that for each other and how to kind of, you know, put that critical eye on, the, on themselves as well? I mostly just tell them the first day of class that no one in the class's opinion matters except for mine. And that uh, most, of the, most of the comments are just exercises <laughs> in futility. No, I tell them, you know, I, for, I tell them a couple of things. I say, you know, the benefit of the creative writing workshop, to me, there are two main benefits. Uh, the first benefit is the, it, it gives you the expectation that you're going to be writing. You have to turn in X amount of work on these particular due dates. So you have to write despite how busy your math class keeps you or your right. whatever kind of organizations you're involved in. And the second thing that it gives you is a sense of community. So I've been in creative writing classes throughout my life. I've studied with like amazing writers and had amazing classmates, but I always learned more and thought the most deeply after class when we were having cocktails at a bar or a pizza joint or on my back deck in graduate school. And so I tell people, you know, these are just ideas, take them, leave them alone. But you need to listen to people. You need to hear them out. You need to consider that they're giving your work an honest read and you're going to give their work an honest read. 
But the real benefit for this class is to forge relationships and to turn out new work. That's the real benefit of the creative writing classroom. And for my writer friends, you know, like, like you and Joe, when we hang out, you know, we're, we're not reading drafts, but we're talking about the business. We're talking sure. about, you know, marketing or book tour or yeah. research, you know, and that stuff is so beneficial. And that's what I always try to impart, especially to undergraduates is, is use this class as an opportunity to find your people and, yep. and, and create a vocabulary that you can communicate on together um communicate with together um so um, do you um you talked about uh you talked about research and uh so much i mean i do not exclusively nonfiction, but mostly nonfiction. um you guys have worked on journalism projects together as well i i come at things from a journalistic um from a journalistic background that sort of informs what I do. But even in your novel, um, your novels, there's such a strong sense of place. So, I mean, for me, world building um, is so much research goes into world building. And for me, a lot of that is images. So I will, like some of the first things I'll do when I'm writing about a particular era or a particular um, you know, moment in time or event is try to find images. And if it's before photography, try and find sketches or maps of the city or something um, of what that world was like. So it can start to feel real for me. And then ideally I can communicate some element of that hopefully to the reader as a, as a writing and photography team, how do those things play in kind of, not like a chicken and egg sense, but I mean, how do those things sort of play off each other when, and I, and it might be different when you're doing um, something for like, you know, a newspaper or a magazine, as opposed to uh, the book project, like step into the circle. Um, can you guys talk about that a little bit? Want to talk about well, anything I mean, in particular? I was going to say because I think sometimes I tend to finish my stuff first for various reasons, but <laughs> not throwing you under the bus. But uh, we did something recently for Annette at Clock Saddle for the Bitter Southerner, and I had no idea what he was writing. And so I was, her photo shoot was approaching, and she lives in Cherokee. So I kept wanting to know what he was writing because for me, that does, that, that does inform what I'm going to do a little bit. Um, and can you just tell her who, who Annette is? Yeah, she um, she has a novel called Even As We Breathe that just came out. Um, and she um, is the first member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee to have a novel published. And her novel takes place at the Gro uh, set of the Grove Park Inn. And so it just came out um, with the University of Kentucky Press, yeah, I think. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, yeah. So um, it's getting a lot of buzz. It's a great book. Um, and so we did a story about, or he, he did the essay, I did the photos and, um, you know, but so, so a lot of times I kind of badger him about what are you writing? What are you doing? Um, and in reality, that probably doesn't change too much, but I, but in my mind it does. Um, and he, the only, like he, he told me, you know, go to the Grove Park, obviously. And I probably maybe wouldn't have done that otherwise. Cause I like to photograph just people, but, um, you know, our girls are our girls are over there talking right now. I'm sorry. Oh, um, come on in. I love those kids. Say hi to Denise. Hi, Denise. We'll do it real, we'll do it real quick. Come here. Hi, Denise. Hi, here, Denise. Come hi. 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 It's nice to see you guys. I'm talking to your I'm talking to your mom and dad about books and photos and all sorts of cool stuff. Denise, uh, they think Denise and Joe own the Grove Park Inn because Joe oh, and Denise took the pool there, and so they, they thought that you, that you guys That's right. the, we the took them to the pool there, yeah. so you know, yeah, yeah, we've got so, place now. Yeah, so I was just saying how you know I'd like to know what you're writing because that usually does kind of it, it probably doesn't change, but I'd like to know what you're writing before you know. Uh, they're 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 having one of their rare experiences getting to watch something and a song that mommy likes came oh. on and they wanted to come tell mommy the song was on. Sweet. Well, what what song was it, mommy? Th these boots are made for walking. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I so, what, 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 what made video soon of that? Yeah. And 
boots. But, but, but I remember Larry was talking about a Nets, a Nets piece in The Bitter Southerner. And it's funny, you know, I, I kind of know Mallory's work and Mallory's aesthetic well enough to know what the images are going to feel like. Sure. Um, like what kind of tenor and kind of tone they're going to have to them. And I'll, I'll, I'll sometimes write with that in mind. And I knew for a Nets piece, I said, you know, you know, I want, I want pictures of the Grove Park. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah, I want some pictures around Cherokee. I want, here's how the book feels, you know, here's what the book feels like. And she came home and showed me the pictures and it was exactly like what the book felt like. On the other hand, we did, um, and we're, we're, we're beginning again a column for several North Carolina magazines. Did you talk about this? Yeah. It's called North Carolina Creators, and it's going to be in South Park Magazine in Charlotte, O'Henry in Greensboro, Pine Straw in Southern Pines in Fayetteville, and then another magazine that I, I can't name right now, but it's going to be a, another big statewide magazine. Um, but the column is on... Uh, creatives in North Carolina, creators who also happen to be affecting social change or serving as economic engines in their communities. And that was really interesting because Mallory and I would meet these people together. And so I didn't know what she was going to shoot and she didn't know what I was going to glean from the interaction. And so we both came home and I looked at her images and then I would told her what my impressions were. And the, we did two of them that have been published so far, one a sculptor in, Gre in Greensboro and one a botanist in Raleigh. And the images and the, the, uh, the essay are kind of in conversation with one another in interesting ways. Um, but that was a really interesting experience. Um, well, we always tend to, for me, I always want to know, you mentioned research. I always, always want to know what the person looks like before I photograph them. I, I've never, actually, I photographed one person blind and he was... Yeah, the photos ended up great, but uh, uh, he was difficult. But um, but normally, even you, Denise, when I did your headshots, I was I know what you look like. I've met you a gazillion times. We're, we're good friends. But I just wanted the way people. I wanted to see like what what photos of you look like, so I can just get an idea. I don't know why, but I just feel the need. I have to see. I want to see the area. I want to see. Um, you know, the the one I mentioned, the guy being cool. I had never met him, and he actually didn't show up the first time. I photographed him. It was a green, at a greenhouse, but I got to see the space. And so the next time when, when we actually did it, I knew exactly where to put him. And he, he didn't want to be there. So we got it done quickly. And so that helped. So for, for me, I, I, it's like a confident, I think a confidence. Thing. I don't necessarily need to see, but I think it's also nice to see how people hold themselves yeah. in photos. And also sure. when people share right. Mallory likes to see, can I say this? I don't know. Mallory <laughs> likes to see <laughs> I'll find out. what photo. Mallory likes to see what photos people share of themselves. Oh yeah, it's always because that tells her something about how they want to be photographed. Yeah, yeah. Like if you share a picture of yourself on social media or your website, then it the, the assumption can be made that you are a, a, at least comfortable. With the you're at least you're comfortable least, with that yeah. photograph. So how right. your body looks, how yeah. your face is, is positioned, what the language right. is saying, and um, and I think it's a similar thing when you're profiling somebody or writing about somebody. You talk to them to get a sense of, you know, who do they think they are and who do I think they are and how do those two things align and how do the, how is that, what they're putting out and what I'm taking in, how is that going to be synthesized to the final, you know, the final product or the final uh, draft of whatever you're writing or photographing? Okay. Well, you know, as, as storytellers though, both of you, uh, whether you're telling a story with photography or telling it with, with words. Um, and you, even when, um, you know, even when we're not writing fact, it's always important to write truth, if you know what I mean. So when you can pick up on, you can tell someone has a very sort of set idea about how they want to present themselves to the world do you to what extent do you feel a responsibility as a storyteller to you know expand that view shift the lens a little bit and kind of share your your vision of that person not necessarily um for i'm talking about more for when you're doing something that is you know a, you know a work an editorial work as opposed to which of your headshots do you like which is obviously a little bit different 
Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. That if, if if the person I'm photographing is the one paying me, I'm gonna I'm gonna sure. make them yeah. look yeah. as great as I can, no matter what, um, if if possible. Um, but for I think for me, it's it's just a matter of what what was my truth in that moment. How did they make me feel? How did you know? How did I perceive them? Um, a lot of what I do is just observing people. I watch people more than I take pictures when I'm there. And a lot yeah. of times I'm looking through my brain, I'm just, but I'm watching, I'm talking, you, you know, and um, so I don't know. I mean, I think that I have more room with editorial stuff to where there might be a photo that maybe isn't, uh, you know, as flattering or maybe, you know, someone, I'm, I think, oh, they might not love this, but it was, this is what it was, or this is, the lighting was dramatic or whatever it was. Um, so I feel more freedom uh, in that case, but I, I do try to, you know, I hate having my picture taken. So I try to always think about, you know, or is this going to, I don't want to ever embarrass anybody or anything, but you know, I have some more, I think I have more freedom. For well, it's funny, you know, and, and the same thing when I'm, when I'm interviewing somebody to profile them and I use Annette, Annette may be watching this. So I, I hate to talk about you in front of you, Annette, if you're watching this, but screw it, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> You know, Annette's novel is about this young Native American man leaving the reservation and going to Asheville in 1942, which feels like a different world than Cherokee. It's just a couple miles away, but it feels like a different world. And then coming back to the reservation and seeing it anew and seeing more possibility in his life. And I knew Annette before I interviewed her for the piece, but when I was interviewing her, that's kind of what things kept circling back to was how and that left Cherokee or left Swain County or, 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 or where she grew up and went to school at Yale and then came back and kind of saw the world anew. So I, I don't think Annette set out to write a book that said, I'm writing thinly veiled autobiographical fiction because she's certainly not. But those thematic similarities were there and it was a way to kind of braid the profile of her together. And another example is you know, we interviewed this sculptor in Greensboro. We drove up there one weekend and spent the night and had a nice time. Greensboro is a great town. And we went and interviewed him at his, at his, um, at his studio. And he was all by himself on this really cold Sunday. This is huge. He's a steel worker. It was worker. like 3,000 square feet. Yeah, this okay. huge a warehouse studio. And he was just so gregarious and so warm, but he was, he was alone in the studio and it just the photographs weren't mm -hmm. it, we we just we just kind of felt like the the feeling we got was not the the reality of the situation and he said you know y'all should come back next weekend i'm going to have a big public iron pour and so we did and we went back the next weekend and he was giving out these little sand molds where you could etch a design and then they had a crew they were pouring molten steel into the the molds there were there were probably 300 yeah. people there yeah. and there was a band and there was food and so the feeling that we got from this guy even though he was solitary in his studio we went back the next weekend and experienced it and then the pictures that Mallory got so I was going to say I can I, I actually that was the one that was the, the thing I said I could share if you wanted me to yeah I'd love, I'd I'd love, love for you to do you see where you share your um if you hover your mouse up over the top of your image, there you go. Yep. Yeah. And you I can, share. Okay. yeah. So this, this was I, wow. coincidentally, uh, so this was the iron pour and that's a blast furnace. And they had all these people were volunteers uh, who trained and learned the, you know, the safety protocols and all that. And it was a, I'll say brotherhood. There were women too, but it was this real, I can't think of a better word, but this real tight knit group of people. I know, who, I was say fraternity. That doesn't really get around it either. Right, know. right. This is a club. It was a great uh, thing, but this, so this is the guy he was speaking about in the, in the lime green sweatshirt. And I took that picture and that is not, that he, that is not his feet. He, that is not who he is at all. But I like, I thought the picture looked kind of cool with the smoke in the back and everything. So I gave that to the magazine but in re reality, like he was much, um, uh, he's down here uh, further down, but this was just his studio. Um, and he had all these community members and, and there were people teaching. Um, let me get to where, and those are the, those are the sand molds Wiley mentioned. I don't know if wow. you can see. Yeah. And so they poured this molten lava and then it cooled 
and then it um you got you popped out the mold that you had this is was him everything was there a lot of alcohol involved in the molten lava kind of pouring no, actually, they not they not very very seriously. so yeah. he was you know he was very serious about um you know that's uh i love that one with the holding the, the what is that actually like what does he start with it's what coke uh, like the the bad coke battery um that goes in the it, it's like coal turned into to to this for blast furnaces i don't know the process we should know it living in west virginia but um and they would just pour it was so hot even being near it um but i'm just trying to there like that that for me is him like he was this warm and friendly but i they didn't i didn't give them that one i gave them the one where he looked where he looked like vulcan yeah yeah and so that you know i don't know if that sort of speaks to your question a bit of about um sometimes sometimes truth uh it, you know isn't as exciting oh god what do i do this looks cool Sorry. no that's fine yeah, I feel you know, you go up to the little uh, that looks awesome go up to the little um hover your, <laughs> hover your mouse over the uh hover your hover your mouse over the the your little window oh, and I, oh, I did it oh my god. i did it there you go okay there we go. There's that a little cover till you should put a little X. It was fine. We didn't see in any inappropriate tabs. It was good. It was like op art for no, a second. There, there wasn't. There wasn't. There shouldn't be any. Is it? Um, is it all? I think it's all. Is it all? So one of the one of the more, and then I want to I want to make sure we we leave time for questions. Um, talk a little bit about how uh, one of one of the more lovely you know collaborations you guys were able to take part in was. Um, the awesome step into the circle, um, writers in modern Appalachia. And uh, Trent, Trent Thompson was one of the editors and he said, um, uh, she sees, that's what he said about, about Mallory, um, that she sees, she really sees people. But I would, I would say that about you as a writer as well, Wiley. How, wh what do you guys do as a writer and a photographer um, and, perhaps even for this project uh to kind of take down that take down that barrier and allow people for so that people allow you into their creative space because you're profiling creatives here uh allow and we're all very private in our weird in our own weird ways to to sort of allow them into your space so you could see them either as a photographer or, for as, or as a writer well can i speak yeah. No. Can I speak? Can I speak? Can I speak? Um, well, I'm thinking about when we, you know, we also, Mallory and I did uh, a column for a bunch of magazines called Drinking with Writers. I think I've we heard would, that. Yeah, we, 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 we would interview and photograph our friends who had like cool stuff going on. That's where or, we went to Little Jumbo. With, that's yeah. exactly, that's right. yeah. And we okay. always would ask people, where do you want to go? Because they would always want to go somewhere that they wanted to be. And when we asked you, Denise, you were like, let's go to Little Jumbo. It's beautiful. And when we went to Little Jumbo, I can't speak for Mallory, but Little Jumbo felt like you. I mean, it, it felt like the way you dressed. It felt like the way you write. It felt like, you know. And so when we go to that place, I probably learned, and granted, I was asking you questions that I wouldn't ask you, like, if we we're having a glass of wine at a restaurant. But I probably learned more about you in that 45 minutes that Mallory was taking pictures than I have in knowing you however long I've known you. I met you right. in 2014 because you were like in your place and eventually the camera kind of dissolves. We're having cocktails. We're just having a conversation. And so I think like, you know, when we when Mallory was photographing like Lee Smith and Ron Rash, she went to their places. You know, if you want to talk yeah. about that. Yeah, I mean. Lee Smith, I spent the night at her house. And so we had dinner and had drinks uh, the night before. And that that helped. And I had met her before too. But um, yeah, um, and Ron Rash, and we, we both of them, we went into their space and Ron had his new novella that just came out spread out on the table. And he was right. very, I mean, like very generous with, with his space and time. Um, but I don't know, it, it's hard because we knew, we knew them, you know, so if that had been a stranger, I photograph strangers all the time, but in this, a creative, I, 
you know, it's, we usually have some connection, right? But and, you didn't first step into the circle when you went to Madison County. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And... I, I met a lot of strangers. And, and I think just being a woman for once worked in my favor because I was unassuming and nobody was scared of me. And I'm five, two. And so men and women would talk to me and, and kids would talk to me and it was OK. Um, you know, and, I, and Rash himself says, you know, it always starts it always starts with a with an image. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But one one of my favorite stories about Mallory going up to Mattis, he went up to Marshall, which you know Marshall's a very different place than it was that I wrote than I wrote about it in 1986 or whatever it was in, in my first novel. But one of my favorite stories is it, it it could be a short story called Mallory spends the day in Marshall, where she gets to Marshall in the <laughs> in the morning sure and just kind of hangs out all day. She just kind of walks around I had and. Beer by myself. She just is drinking and, and eating lunch and wandering in and out of stores. And she got so many gorgeous pictures that didn't end up in the book, pictures of just everyday people going about their lives in Marshall. And at one point she approached a dad and a son and just started talking to them and said, um, hey, I'm in town taking pictures. And they were like, yeah, we saw you earlier. <laughs> and so, you, you know, you kind of small, but you yeah. go to people's space and you just kind of find them in their lives. Yeah. And, you know, she approaches them without the, the camera's not like this. Their camera's down. No, and I, she, I actually carry a backpack. And so I don't even have my camera out when I meet people. And I always start and then I'm like, oh, hey, you know what? I'm doing these pictures. Can I? And then they're like, oh, yeah. Another example of that, Denise, and forgive me for talking so much is. Uh, I guess it was in uh, it was in the uh, let me see the the fall, maybe the maybe the the fall of of uh, of twenty fall of twenty eighteen, the Silent Sam uh, statue got pulled down in Chapel Hill yeah. in August of twenty eighteen, the, the Confederate Memorial, Monument. and yeah. so in September we were interviewing Teresa Ann Fowler in Raleigh, yeah, and we had the day to ourselves because somebody was with our girls. And we said, let's just drive on the Chapel Hill and just see what's going on at Silent Sam, see if she can get some pictures. So we roll up and there's this biker gang there guarding the pedestal that Silent Sam was on, wow. looking for Antifa. And for the <laughs> first time in my life, the, the, the white Southern guy felt, I felt threatened by them. Yeah. Because I thought if these guys knew what I thought about their mission, they would curb kick me in broad daylight, <laughs> yeah. you know. But Mallory goes in and she walks up and says, hey. Look on Mallory's face right now. Yeah, how are y'all? How are you? We're good, we're here, we're here guarding this for Antifa. So she starts asking them questions, sets her bag down. I'm just gonna take some pictures of the pedestal and they kind of shrink back and she's photographing the pedestal and the flowers that all the Confederates have left and then she notices them kind of warming up and oh you y'all look great together can i get a picture of you two and before we know it after like 15 minutes these people are flashing white power signs and holding open their yeah. I'm, a, I'm a dirt bag deplorable trump lover t-shirt they and were saying the stuff they were saying to me i kept telling i was like get away from me. i'm like get breathing away. into a bag behind was, a tree they weren't gonna do anything. and she's like public. getting a tattoo uh in front of the silent sam monument because she can it she she has a like i'm the kind of person i stand back and i observe and mallory goes in and interacts and i'm just not that way uh but she is that way and she can go in and kind of pry the lid off the situation and and visually get to the truth of it whereas i have to stand back and constantly gauge and figure out where the levers are and stuff like that yeah well even if somebody's truth is deplorable as in this as in this situation going at it from a place of observance allows you to get more of a that's how you get a better it's how you get a better sure. story actually mm -hmm. um it's uh that's so interesting where are those pictures where well, are those the, the sad thing is that we had this whole idea about we were going to do with confederate we did we did three of them where we were going to talk about historically what was going on at the time and it just kind of that was it didn't it didn't take off um but i would love to do so I would, yeah. i've never you i i've never used them uh, and i used them in a workshop actually recently to talk about that and i showed them one picture where you couldn't see their shirts and they're laughing and i'm like i could have showed this to you or and i showed them a picture where the guy's got a knife and he's got 
uh, a thing on his shirt about guns and like how menacing it, it was to me at least felt menacing. And so, you know, I could have, I, ch I had to choose, but I knew in, in that moment that them laughing and being lighthearted was not the truth of it. It, you know, it happened, but, but th those photos didn't show. It wasn't the experience of it. No, it was, they were, they, they were, you know, I wasn't scared when I have a camera, I'm not scared at all, but, but it was scary. And I think as a woman too, like a lot of times, you know, you can get away with things just because they're not threatened by you, you know? So right. I, there are so many times when being a woman has, does not have an advantage. So when, when I can find an advantage, I like to use it and being a, being a pretty small person, you know, I think I can go to, a, I can go to a playground and take a picture and no one thinks anything of me, but if a man was there with a camera, I'm sure, sure. they'd you know, so I feel like I have a little, but on the other hand, I did, I got invited into certain places in Marshall and then I started to go and then I was like, oh, I probably shouldn't be by myself in some house, you know, so it's, you know. Right. Okay. I, this is all, I could, you know, I could talk <laughs> to you guys for, I mean, and I will at another, at another time, <laughs> just not on camera. I, I, for what it's worth, I would love to see you guys do something with those photos. I think it's still uh, relevant. Mm -hmm. Before yeah. we go to the questions, it's time to unveil your specialty cocktail. I think you're going to be very excited. So this was crafted by uh, lovely Shawl Gray from Little Jumbo Cocktail Bar, the home of craft. And here it is. It is the fireside. Mm. So this actually is, he said this was definitely inspired not just by this part of North Carolina, Western North Carolina, but also by the season. And you'll notice one of the ingredients is apple wedge cider. There's some Old Forester bourbon, lemon, honey, bitters. Um, the apple wedge cider is actually from right down the road in Hendersonville, North Carolina and Apple Wedge, they they sell apples, apple apples. And then this time of year, they also uh, make their own cider. So if you are if you are in the area or you can get Apple Wedge Cider has a lovely uh, has a lovely website. We will share it. Joe will put that up there. I'll send it along. And you can um, if you can use that look a little local Western North Carolina apple flavor for this lovely cocktail, the fireside. In honor, of, it's it's his tweak on it. the uh, the bourbons the bourbons his tweak and the cider is his tweak, and I think it is appropriate to appropriate to you guys and to Western North Carolina and certainly to uh, the the lovely fall season when you want to curl up by the fireside with some uh, with some alcohol. Uh, <laughs> so the, that I will um, that that uh, you can always rewatch these uh, later in the week by coming back to craft or going to YouTube, and I will also those will eventually all live up on on my website. But now let's go down and look at some of these questions. Wiley, when does the new novel hit the stores? Can we pre-order? Uh, no, Pre-orders aren't up yet. Uh, I think the plan right now is to have it out at the end of the summer next year. So um, mid-August, early September. Um, that's the plan right now, as far as I know. So no pre-order yet. Uh, I'm in the final death throes of edits right now. It's very good. Very good. Um, we're not looking at manual. We're not looking at PDF manuscript pages just yet. But I'm still. You know, I, I told somebody today in, a, in, a, in an interview that I'm at the point where I am sweeping the sidewalk after cutting the grass. Uh, so that, that's, that's the point I'm in right now with the book. <laughs> that's funny. I like that that's your metaphor. My metaphor <laughs> is I'm deciding whether or not to put another bracelet on or if I actually <laughs> need to totally, you know, swap out this necklace. That, that, that's that's what I usually do. How do you maintain, this is, uh, I, I was actually gonna get to this as well, but I didn't, so I'm glad it was asked. How are you maintaining your creativity? Not just, I mean, you've been parents for you know six years now, but during a pandemic, which is changing parenting. So how is that, how is that working or not working or how is it? Um, we, we, we rent an office um, outside of our tiny house. And so that is has been our savior. Um, before the pandemic, he would take the mornings, I would take the afternoons. 
Um, but now it's mostly me just being like, get out of the house and write whenever you find, wherever you can find time. Um, our little girl started kindergarten and they are doing, uh, it's a, it's a little, uh, Montessori school. And so they have a small class and they, they're doing in person with masks. So that has helped to have to start getting a routine back. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think you just getting away from us has been Please. Yeah, uh, you know, our, our work life seesaws a lot. So, you know, there are times m less frequently than, than my panic work where Mallory's like bearing down on finishing something. And so she needs to go unfettered to the office. And then, then more likely it's me because I'm teaching and I've got, you know, a few more irons in the fire right now at this point. And so I have, you know, time when I've got to go to the office. You know, but it, it is hard, you know, I mean, when we're home, we're very much at home because we did downsize. We are living in a smaller home, which we I, we're, we're joking about it, but I absolutely love everything about the decision that we made to do that. And so when we're home, we're very much home. I can't sneak off and work on a scene. She can open her computer Our to edit photos. Lock. Our doors don't lock. It's an old 1940s cottage. Um, and so, you know, our separation between work life and home life now is pretty distinct and it feels good. It feels very healthy. When we had an office in that, in that, in our old house and Mallory had a huge, our dining room table actually was her desk in our master bedroom. Cause we lived in a much larger house and I had an office where that I had a restroom with a full shower and I could sleep in there if I needed to. It wasn't a healthy work life balance because there was no line of demarcation between working and not working. And now when you're home, your work day has to be done because it has to be over. And so it's amazing, you know, if I take our oldest to school at 815, how much panic work you can get done between 815 and noon if I come home and relieve Mallory. So she goes to the office and I put our youngest down. Right. We do that a lot of the time we try to I try to, you know, but, but recently it's been my book edits, my, my revisions all the time. Um, but those are our best days. When I go in the morning and she goes in the afternoon, those are our best days. Yeah, sometimes obstacles and hindrances actually do make you kind of, instead of like, I've got all day, it's, oh my God, I've got three hours. I've got I've to get it together. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They really, um, they really, that stuff really focuses me. Yeah. So, and I don't know if you guys had um, any say in this, but this is interesting. Who wasn't included in Step Into the Circle that you wish um, maybe you had been able to include? Or was that sort of already decided before? Already decided, yeah. Because he what? Yeah. about Ron. They had already decided, right? Yeah, they asked me about Ron Rash early on. And, um, you know, I think that, I think they were other big name authors they wanted from the region who for one reason or, or another didn't didn't end up taking part in the project but you know what i like about the book is it's it represents the breadth of the appalachian experience of the diversity found in the region you know i think appalachia has a tendency uh to be perceived as being you know white and, and male yeah. and relatively narrow but we have you know writers like, you know, Annette Sino Clapsaddle writes a piece in there. Uh, Krista Wilkinson, Frank X. Walker, who are two yeah. of my favorite American writers working today are in there as well. So there's a breadth of diversity in the book that I think will surprise a lot of people. Um, so that felt that felt really satisfying. But you know, you know, what is Appalachia? You know, you look at a, at a writer like um, uh, Richard, what, what's the guy who wrote the overstory? Uh, Richard, Richard, Powers? You know Richard Powers? Richard Powers? Richard, oh, wait. Who wrote the overstory? His name fell out of my head. Richard Powers? Is that his name? I think it's Power. I can look. Joe will look. Joe, lurking Joe will tell us. Anyway. He, he, he lives in the Smoky Richard Mountains. Powers. Richard Powers. He lives in the Smoky Mountains somewhere. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, the, the, what, what is Appalachia? Yeah. And like, and like Robert, Robert Beatty living in Asheville or, or oh, yeah. Sarah Gruen living in Asheville now. David Joy. Uh, David Joy, who's a, a relatively young writer, who's got a ton of books out. Um, uh, uh, Caleb Johnson, who I know you and Joe are friends with, living in yep. Boone now from Alabama. Yep. And so the breadth of the region is surprising. It's regenerative. Um, there's still a lot of good rural work coming out by writers like Leah Hampton. Um, 
but 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 th- but this book, Step Into the Circle, felt like a snapshot. And we weren't the editors, so we didn't have say over who got in and who didn't. We were just happy to have to have been included um, in the project. So. Yeah. Um, Wiley, have you ever created a character or storyline based on a photograph that Mallory has taken? Hmm. Oh gosh, not that I can think of right now. But. Well, I've I, I, I've I've based stuff on a lot of stuff that we've talked about, and you know, with Mallory's photos, most of the photos she takes are of our lives and of our day to day experiences and our kids. And what I appreciate about those photos is the emotional tenor of them. And I'm a writer who works less on images. I know you mentioned Ron saying he works based on image. But what I always write based on is emotion. I know what emotion I want to reach in a scene. I know how I want to trouble that emotion, maybe turn it around by the end of the scene. And I always know what kind of emotion I want to arrive at on the final page of a book. I I know how I want the book to feel. And her photos communicate emotion to me, particular memories that are always laden with emotion. And so I can't remember that I've seen a picture of our girls and said, I'm going to write based on that picture. But I know that I've seen pictures of hers and wanted to instill my own work with that sense of emotion that is Mm -hmm. in the photograph. So I I, I can say that. Okay. There's something evocative about a particular image that you wanted to, there was a feeling, it it brought out a feeling in you that you wanted to communicate. Um, Judy asks, do you get model releases, Mallory, from the people you photograph? Um, sometimes. Um, sometimes, yeah. Um, it just depends on what it's for. Normally, it's for work or, yeah. I think really legally, you don't need one unless it's for commercial work, yeah. I think, um, from my understanding, um, and commercial work being just like an ad um, yeah. or something like where you're making money. So um, I did not get, I got one, I got one model release in, in the year I took pictures for Step Into the Circle, I got one. Um, and some of the photos were in the Knoxville Museum of Art. And so she uh, she was very, she just wanted to see the pictures and was very understandably. Um, and so I just made sure I got a model release because I could tell I didn't want her later to change her mind after I photographed her. So she yep. was happy with everything. So, yeah. Great. Okay. And um, some guy named Joe... Um, asks Wiley, uh, you told a reporter that you put everything you knew about writing into your last book, The Last Ballad. How do you feel about the book you're working on now? You know, The Last Ballad was such a thick, layered book. And I, 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 I mentioned earlier that even up until the very end, we didn't know whether or not it was going to work. And I can remember that book came out in October of 2017. And I remember the year before in the fall of 2016, we were living in Asheville. And I remember being on the phone with my editor at a playground in Kenilworth near our, the house we were living in. And him and, and the two of us dipping our toe into the possibility that it was a failed novel. And that book was, and I remember him asking me, what do you want this book to be? What do you want it to feel like? And, and I remember saying, I just want it to feel rich. I want it to feel evocative of life. I want it to feel like life feels like. So in order to achieve that, I did put every craft, every bit of craft knowledge I have, I put into that book. Every bit of characterization study, every sense of setting, every trick I knew to pull the levers of characterization of plot, of of dialogue or scene, I put them in that book. The book that I'm writing now that that I'm essentially finished with is much more narrow. It has a much smaller cast of characters. It takes place over a- a very specific focus too. Yeah, it's a very condensed period of time. It's a very tight, tightly shot book. So it doesn't require the breadth of I don't, craft stuff's the wrong stuff is what I'll say, but it doesn't require the same the same burden of of uh, of uh, chicanery that that the last ballad required. And so what I but but at the same time, 
the challenge in that has been Last Ballad was a novel that I wanted to be read for its richness. And this is a novel, my new book is a novel I want to be read for its characterization and its plot. And so that's a different thing that I've had to learn is how to write a plot, how to, how to make a narrative spring forward. And that, that's been its own challenge. Very nice. I can't wait. I watched your, um, your UNCA talk, uh, I guess it was earlier this week. When you last were, week on, on Thursday, I think. When you were when you were uh, when you were reading from the novel, and uh, I can't wait. It's gonna be, I mean, you had talked to me a little bit about it before, but I'm I'm very. Well, you and Joe were some of the only people that I remember. I remember talking to you all about it yeah. and being like, "Oh my God, I can't believe I've let this novel go. I've spoken it into existence." I know. Now I can't. Like, oh, no going back. Um. Well, thank you guys. Of course, um, thank you. Thanks. Thanks everybody for, for great questions and, and, and for tuning in. I will, uh, buy, buy Mal Mallory and Wiley's books and step into the circle and lots of other things. Links are in the chat and I will be sending around. Um, you can click on the button here or, uh, support your own local indie bookstore. We all need to be supporting our wonderful, uh, lo all our local businesses right now. It's a tough time for folks. Um, and bookstores are our community centers, really, I think. So uh, let's do that when we can. Um, I'm so glad everybody uh, joined us. I will send around a recap. You can watch this anytime in the future. You just come right back here. Um, and uh, that's it. Next week, we have uh, Shannon McKenna Schmidt, who's going to talk about novel destinations. It'll be some good armchair traveling uh, a book that she did that's about all these amazing literary destinations all over the world that you can go travel to. Uh, and Shannon herself has lived all over the world for the last several years with her husband. So it's going to be a very, very interesting uh, conversation um, about writing and also about unique, empowering life choices. So um, I love you guys. Thank you so much. And yeah. Yeah. And we're looking forward to your book too. We can't wait for it to come out. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We will have another conversation and the tables will be turned and you guys will be, uh, you guys will be talking to me and it'll be fun. No matter well, what. You. Joe and Shaw as well. Absolutely. Um, okay. Bye guys. See you next week. Take care. Good night. <laughs>